So welcome everyone today to our Humanitarian and Conflict Response Careers Day. This is a special session aimed at our uh, six formers. So some of our six formers, you may just have gotten the invite from your teachers. Um, you may have heard about it being passed on in that respect. We also have some of our current offer holders. So those are our six form students or um, having graduated but deciding to go to university, they've already been made an offer to study with us. And this is another opportunity for them to learn a bit more about HCRI and our program in international disaster management and humanitarian response. So today's session is gonna run slightly differently than what our typical sessions are that we have in HCRI. So we're joined by both academics and some of our current students. So we have uh, Drs. Lee Stenkwa and Dr. Jessica Hopkins, as well as myself, Dr. Amanda McCorkindale, and we're lecturers here in HCRI. And we'll go into our, our bios a bit more as we go along, but then we're also joined by two of our students. So Marcel Mapp is one of our third year undergraduate students, and we have Ikra Shah, who is one of our postgraduate students. But she also attended the University of Manchester for her undergraduate degree. So what we'll be doing is taking this opportunity to discuss our backgrounds a bit more, information about the program as well, and because we received some questions prior to, to today's event. So I'm going to cover some of those in the intro now, um, but giving you a better idea of what we do in HCRI, what it's like, what is humanitarianism, um, how we got on the paths that we're on currently, and different ways of kind of getting into the field and what that means and what different things you can be studying with it as well. For any of those who attended um, a bit earlier, so before one, you were privy to some conversations we were having between one, one, one another. Um, so Marcel and Ikra were telling us about the dissertations they're covering. We had Lisa um, talking a bit about the work that she's doing. You can see her slides. So you'll be hearing a bit more about all of that as we go along. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping. As I mentioned, we are recording today's session. We had one of our attendees ask if you need to take notes for today uh, or just to listen. You can take notes if anything kind of stands out and you feel it's pertinent information, then feel free to jot it down. Likewise, we're happy to answer questions. Um, so you can post questions in the chat box and we'll respond as we go along. Um, but also if you think of something afterwards, you can always email us at hcri at manchester.ac.uk and it'll get forwarded to, to one of us. So don't feel bad if you think of something two hours after now um, and you want to follow up with something, we're happy to help. And that's what we're here for as well. Um, so as I mentioned, my name is Dr. Amanda McCorkendale. I'm a lecturer in humanitarian studies here at the University of Manchester in HCRI. I'm the postgraduate teaching director and I'm also in charge of admissions and school outreach for HCRI, which is, so if you do apply for your program, to study with us um, on IDMHR. I'll be the one that's getting to know you, your application and helping you along with that process. So please don't be shy. No question is silly. I've heard almost everything beforehand. So please get in touch and let me know if I can help at all because that's part of my role. For those that um, take some of the questions that we got beforehand, just as a reminder, entry requirements are AAB and we recommend you have um, one of those within a humanities subject. However, don't let that limit you. If you are passionate about the topic and this is something you want to study and you don't have a humanities subject, I would recommend getting in touch and speaking to me directly about it because we have um, a number of students who come from different backgrounds and it is one of the strengths of our programs that we are interdisciplinary and really um, treasure the fact that we have people coming from different backgrounds, different interests, different areas. So there are ways of, of kind of going around the, the humanities um, tick box. It might be looking at asking you to write an essay and we can we can work around that. So don't don't feel put off. Um, what was one of the other questions we got? Um, what are the highly recommended A levels? So we talked about that and degrees if you're interested in pursuing a job in this field. What are the entry requirements and what careers can the course lead to? So we'll be talking about that a bit more throughout. Um, but one of the reasons, so one of the, the benefits for HCRI is we are this in, interdisciplinary institute. Um, we were formed between a number of academics and practitioners over 10 years ago now. And we have medical doctors, historians, geographers, um, public health uh, researchers like 
Lisa, who, which she'll be going into in a minute. Um, we have historians, educationalists, so we come from a lot of different backgrounds, peace and conflict studies, etc. Um, and we try to bring it together. So our undergraduate program is very much the academic introduction to humanitarian studies or disaster management. So you start with a very theoretical base in years one into year two, and then you get to really start choosing the modules that you want to be taking to really suit your interests. So it might be peace and conflict studies, it might be humanitarianism, it might be disaster management or global health. Um, so that by the time you graduate, you have a really specific knowledge in what you're interested in. So like Marcel and Ikra uh, will kind of mention what their dissertations are, are really based on what they've learned and, and how they've developed those researching and skills that they have, as well as that wider knowledge. Um, and that leads into the careers and, and practitioner side afterwards. But what we hope to do with every year we hold a careers day event and throughout your time with us, we support you in kind of reaching out to organizations, figuring out which careers might be for you and putting you in touch with those people in the field. We have over 10 years of alumni now um, from our postgraduate programs and our undergraduate programs working in this field. Um, so we like to try to link people up where we can. So I will leave that um, at the moment. So we've still got um, another question talking about the geographical aspect, but we'll cover that towards the end. I'll now hand over to Dr. Lisa Dankla, who will give us a brief presentation on her research and what she teaches at the undergraduate level. She will have to run off uh, after she uh, finishes her presentation. So if you have any questions, please post them as she's talking. Over to you, Lisa. And Lisa, if you want to unmute, perfect. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, so thank you very much all for joining and welcome to my talk. Um, so my name is Dr. Lisa Dankwa, as Amanda mentioned, and I recently joined HCRI as a lecturer in global health. Um, so I'll just give you a bit of an um, overview of my talk. So I'll give, be giving you some, some of my background. Um, I'll also be providing you with um, some further information about my um, specialism and wider relationship with international disaster management, a bit of a short taster to one of the lectures and any questions. So just a bit about me. So I'm currently a lecturer in global health and humanitarian and conflict response institute. I started in October, 2020. I've worked in various research and teaching roles since 2003. And I've implemented various research projects in global health since 2007 in low middle income settings, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, the Caribbean and South Asia. So in terms of my academic background, I have a BA in human geography from Queen Mary University of London. I also have an MSc in public health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I also have an MSc in social statistics research methods, also from Southampton, and a PhD in Social Statistics and Demography, also from the University of Southampton. So here's a, um, just a photograph slide just showing where I came from in terms of my original background in human geography and the picture at the top shows the human geography department at um, Queen Mary and where I sp spent a lot of my time in um, Mile End in East London and to my journey at HCRI. So in terms of my specific interest, I'm interested in humanitarian public health emerging infectious diseases, disease surveillance and response, and really the role of novel technologies for disease surveillance, for example, digital health and how it's applied during. I'm particularly interested in outbreak preparedness and response and research during humanitarian emergencies, and also the field of environmental health, for example, water sanitation and hygiene. So here's just a slide showing some research that I was involved in during the 2014-2016 Ebola virus disease outbreak in Sierra Leone. So in terms of the undergraduate courses I teach on, I teach on international disaster management in scholarship and practice and I contribute to seminars. I also teach on another module, uh, scholarship and debates and contribute to seminars. I also lead seminars on the emergency humanitarian assistance module, so that's a second year module, and on the introduction to global health, which is a third year module, 
and I've got some taster lectures to follow to introduce you to the topics that we address in this module. So in terms of focusing on sort of the wider applications, it's important to understand, as I'm sure you're all aware, that the multidisciplinary nature of international disaster management and humanitarian response covers a range of disciplines. So for example, the natural and social sciences, medicine and the arts. And it really provides an important contemporary understanding of areas in development, disaster risk management and peace and conflict studies and seeks to bridge the gap between these fields. So I personally feel that my research interest is in the impact of international disasters and how we respond to them. And it covers many of these disciplines. So in terms of some taster lectures from the introduction to global health module, I'll now focus on two taster lectures, the so one on emerging infectious disease and the other on the use of a digital application during the Ebola outbreak in 2015. So firstly, I'd like to really sort of focus on the module aims. So the aim of this introduction to global health module is really to introduce students to the main sort of concepts of global health and the basic principles, to understand inequalities in health, and to really introduce the main contemporary players within the global health system and to critically evaluate their strengths and weaknesses. We also seek to engage with global health challenges through an interdisciplinary approach um, and provide insights from public health, social theory and other disciplines. So we ran this module last semester and we had these interactive seminars and debates and students um, did practice presentations and also final presentations. So now I'm going to focus on my um, on the introductory lecture that I'm going to propose to you, which is the introduction to emerging infectious diseases. So emerging infectious diseases can be considered as diseases that have previously or have newly appeared in incidence or geographic range. And most of these have been defined as diseases that have emerged in the past 20 years. And there's no set definition of what an emerging infectious disease is and there are different definitions that have been found to exist. So there are two major categories, newly emerging infectious diseases, for example, like COVID-19 that we're seeing now, current global pandemic, and re-emerging infectious diseases. And for example, HIV is considered a prototype emerging infectious disease, as it's one that newly appeared in humans back in the 1980s. So as I mentioned to you, there are two key categories of newly emerging, so for example, SARS, the epidemic that happened in 2003, and re-emerging diseases. And I'm now going to explain a little bit more about these two distinctions. So re-emerging diseases, for example, diseases such as cholera, and these typically indicate a breakdown in the public health system. So this map from Public Health England shows the distribution of newly emerging and re-emerging infectious disease outbreaks since 1998. And as you can see, there have been many. So it's not just the Ebola virus disease outbreak, but there have been outbreaks of Zika virus, monkeypox virus, MERS-CoV, which is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which is a form of coronavirus. And so you can see from this map that there have been several different outbreaks of diseases. And most of these emerging infectious diseases occur when animals meet humans. And it's estimated that approximately 70% of these occur in wild animals. And since the 1970s, it's estimated that approximately 40 infectious diseases have, have occurred. And here you'll just see a timeline that illustrates the, the map that I previously showed in terms of diseases that have emerged. So for example, in 1998, Nipah virus, and there have also been repeated Nipah virus outbreaks in many South Asian countries. Lassa fever, for example, in West Africa, um, which is a disease spread by, it's a disease spread by rats. And then more recently, we're seeing other types of outbreaks, for example, Zika virus, Ebola virus disease, also sometimes we see re of um, particular diseases. So for example, if you take the case of Ebola, um, there have been several outbreaks since it was first identified in 1976. So another lecture that I'm going to provide you with some information on is one to do with digital technologies and the use of a mobile application for Ebola contact tracing in Sierra Leone. So in terms of this study, which was called the Ebola contact tracing study, I was part of this study when I worked at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So I spent nine months in Sierra Leone conducting this study in, in the Port Loco district of Northern Sierra Leone. And for this study, we sought to address the key constraints of a, a paper-based system that was being used for Ebola contact tracing and monitoring. 
So I'm sure that you've all heard quite a lot about contact tracing, um, particularly now during the COVID-19 pandemic, and some innovative approaches that can be used, for example, the use of digital technologies and smartphones. So the aim of the research really was to describe the feasibility and effectiveness of a smartphone electronic data capture management system to improve the monitoring of contacts of confirmed Ebola cases in this particular district. And we also wanted to provide detailed guidance on how we could best implement this system. So Ebola contacts are people who've come into contact with somebody who's potentially been um, and has been exposed to Ebola virus disease. And in this type of study design, we use a type of design called a cluster randomized trial, which is a type of clinical trial design using the standard which was which was being used with paper and an intervention, which was our Ebola contact tracing app, which I'll show you a picture of. So in this Port Loco district, there were 11 um, chiefdoms or what we call clusters. And we, we randomized those. So we randomized five to receive the standard, which was the paper and six to receive the intervention. And then we had particular primary outcomes that we were interested in. And this diagram just shows, uh, depicts the actual study process and the study design and what we did. So within the introduction to global health lecture, I introduced students to this design and some of the challenges that we faced on the ground in implementing this study during a humanitarian emergency. And this slide just shows the Ebola contact tracing app, so the ECT app. And this was the intervention that we designed as part of this study. I also went into quite some depth to discuss some of the design and implementation issues. So if you're interested in doing research during a humanitarian emergency or during a disease outbreak, some of the challenges that you might face and the practical issues on the ground. And that's what I'm particularly interested in. So thank you very much. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that, Lisa. Um, as we mentioned before, we've got, um, Lisa just highlighted our global health and the medical side of what we do within HCRI. And I know we had that question that came up um, just before Lisa started regarding whether we cover politics as well. And as Lisa highlighted, we have the medical side of what we do. We look at politics, we look at the history of humanitarian responses, we look at peace and conflict studies, um, geography and, and human geography as well. So we have um, one of our lecture, a few of our lecturers looking at geography and the role of um, using GIS in, in responses and critically analyzing that data on how we can better respond. Um, so we are very multidisciplinary. So we have Lisa talking about some of the modules that that we offer at second and third year, as well as first year um, that she's teaching on. I'll now hand over to Dr. Jessica Hawkins um, and have her go into a bit of her background. She is our undergraduate director as well. So she's got a better overview of our entire undergraduate program. So over to you, Jess. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, Welcome everyone. Um, it's great to see so many of you here today. And um, I am, as Amanda said, I'm the undergraduate program director. So basically, when you, um, if you start on a degree at HRI, I'm the one who you receive lots of emails from all the time, because I'm the one that passes all your information to you from the school or from the faculty um, regarding your degree program. And for some students, I may be your academic advisor. And then for some students, I may also be your um, your tutor or lecturer for some of your modules and because I'm undergraduate program director I also teach some of the core modules on the undergraduate degree. In first year I teach the core module on scholarship and practice which is about teaching you the skis the skills to transition from school to university so teaching you how to do critical writing, teaching you how to do critical reading and how to um, produce uh, referencing that is adheres to all standards and also um, I introduce you to some of the core subjects that we engage with at HRI and then in third year I also teach the core module which is the dissertation which I'm sure Marcel will talk a little bit more about. So a little bit about me and how I got here. Um, so I um, at school I loved all subjects, but in particular, I was um, particularly keen on languages and history. And so I studied German and French for my A-levels with history. 
um, back in the day when you can only do three. And um, so I still couldn't decide what to do at university um, when I got to that point of um, having to choose a degree. So I chose a degree program that enabled me to do all three of those pretty much. Um, but actually in the end, I ch changed from uh, French, I changed to Italian. So I did my undergraduate degree in European studies with German and Italian. And I was always interested in European conflicts, in war and conflicts with Second World War, First World War, um, and obviously f um, understanding it from different perspectives throughout Europe. And um, I did my undergraduate degree, which enabled me to do a um, module in genocide studies, which helped me to try and see how war and conflict played out outside of Europe. And that's really when things started to change for me. And that also coincided with voluntary work that I was doing for the Make Poverty History campaign, which was a long, long time ago, but it was an Oxfam led campaign about trying to reduce poverty um, throughout the world, but in particular in the global south. And so I was heavily involved with that. I was studying this genocide um, a course and I realized that actually what I really wanted to do was um, work in the humanitarian sector and I obviously had the benefit that I had quite a few languages under my bow I had also studied GCSE Spanish and then when I lived abroad because I had a um, year abroad but as part of my degree I also continued with my Spanish studying Spanish in a German speaking country is rather bizarre but I'm, I did that as well whilst I was abroad and um, then, yeah, I, life just sort of happened and I ended up in all sorts of different careers. So I did an English language assistantship role after my undergraduate degree in Switzerland um, with the aim of trying to get into Geneva and the international organisations. And then the recession happened and I got a job in export sales. Okay, so working for a capitalist organization, selling stuff to make somebody richer. Um, however, one of your questions was about what kind of work experience um, should we try and do or voluntary work experience. And I would say, okay, it's important to do voluntary work, but it's also important to have, have some sort of part time job, whether it's that's through your A levels. Um, or through your university degree, if you can. And I know Marcel also has a part-time job. I have done loads of different part-time jobs. I was employee of the month at McDonald's. I um, worked at um, Asda in their freezer section. I worked, one of my best jobs was working at Manchester United Foundation, uh, Manchester United as a waitress for the very, very, very rich. Um, I have worked in charity shops. I have um, worked in, um, obviously, in export sales and secondary schools, all sorts of different jobs I've had. <coughs> Excuse me. But the key point I'm trying to make here is that whatever those jobs are, you are developing skills and you don't have to think about the job, i.e. serving burgers and fries. You have to think about the skills that you are developing and they have always stood me in good stead. The very fact I had excellent team working skills, I hope, Amanda, um, has shown and I got that from working in a team at the age of 16 in McDonald's. The very fact that I have um, good organizational skills was because I had this job in export sales and I had to organize sales orders, ensure that um, uh, the product was delivered on time and I got used to Excel and all these skills are really good that will add to a degree in international disaster management because what you want is that full portfolio and that full portfolio includes the knowledge and I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but also the skills to just do basic things like admin and logistics um, timekeeping, management of resources and projects, basic skills that you can get in doing any kind of part time work or voluntary work as well, if you if you prefer. Um, so I just wanted to spend a few minutes, if that's OK, Amanda, talking a little bit about um, the um, the module that I offer at second year, which is actually related to my research. So my research is looking, I'm quite historical, I'm historical sociologist, we call ourselves, not that that might not mean much to anyone, even the panel here. But what I tend to do is look at um, processes of history 
and um, social change over long periods of time. And I would like to share my screen, if at all possible, Amanda, um, because I do have been researching processes of conflict and state formation in Uganda, and that's always been my case study. But I've also diverged to other East African countries, such as Rwanda, and through that, I started looking at refugees, refugees from, from, from the colonial period, but also refugees today, the South Sudanese refugees in Uganda, the refugee crisis as a result of the genocide in Rwanda. So I, I started a module called Conceptualizing the Camp. Now, hopefully you can see that, Amanda, a thumbs up would be great. So this is... Um, week two of my new module which talks about um, how we understand the camp so that could be the refugee camp but it could also be a concentration camp it could also be a detention center or it could be a um, improvised camp such as Calais and so um, in this module we are looking at how camps have changed how they have um, evolved over time and how they are now seen today as places of sanctuary whereas actually they come from the origins of um something quite evil and horrid in our history and i'm just at the moment working on a lecture of the origins of the um camp and looking at the colonial concentration camps in africa um and my students can you also see that amanda so my students this week have been working on the camp in popular imagination and it's quite interesting so one has put um on this um, padlet for me about the Uyghur muslim internment camps in china currently some of them talked about the um your, uh, camps in um Tempelhof airport in, um in germany and then others are talking about uh, detention centers on the u.s border and then obviously the, eight, the typical camps that we study as students in secondary schools in the UK are those of the, of the Holocaust. So um, within this module, we are um, going through a historical sociology of the camp and looking at how the camp, which is seen as a place of sanctuary today, has evolved into this, this place. And actually it might not be a place of sanctuary for those people who have to be in them. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about my um, course. One of my favorite courses, I teach postgraduate courses as well and all sorts of other courses, but I just wanted to add, one of your questions was, do you think we're doing enough for the pandemic in um, lower income countries or the global South, as I tend to use the term? In terms of vaccination, that's a whole different question. But in terms of my understanding of how it's worked out in Uganda, they have, they have responded so much better than any Western country I know of. Uganda shut its borders, it in, involved checkpoints, it confined people, okay, it put in lockdowns straight away. And that was based upon their experiences of previous pandemics and crises, such as Ebola. It had the knowledge, it had the experience of what to do. And as a result, there's been, the, the number of deaths have been in the hundreds rather than the hundred thousands. And so I think there's a lot that we can learn about the global South in situations like this today. There were massive global structural inequality issues related to the vaccine, vaccine and vaccination system, but that's for another discussion. But there's lots we can learn from the global south in crises, not just in pandemics. Um, anything else, Amanda? But I'll, I'm happy to respond to questions as well. No, thank you so much for that, Jess. That was a very um, great introduction to your background. Um, and you are a good team player, I have to say. It has paid off over the years. Um, <laughs> But no, we really appreciate it. And thank you for that side of it. Alice did ask, I wondered if you could ask this, um, do you find the work rewarding? So studying what we study is tough, right? Okay, you don't choose this degree because you want a good fun time. You choose to study these subjects because you care, because you're passionate, because you have empathy for everyone, for humanity, and because you want to make a change, whether it's a small, tiny change or big, big changes, because you, you want to make a difference. And I know because I'm teaching focus, because I'm teaching people like Marcel, I'm, I like to think that something along the way, I've 
made him think differently or not me but he's read something that i've told him to read or he's followed an idea that's gone on and now marcel is just creating these massive fantastic changes something i could never do that's just i'm just i'm 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 an academic i love to read books but what i love seeing is how our students are making changes how they are having this voice and i hope that doesn't sound patronizing or um anything but i find that rewarding i also find a whole day reading about concentration camps really rewarding <laughs> it's depressing and you have to have a lot of self-care that's really important about this degree you have to understand where your limits are and understand how you can support yourself in those limits when you're dealing with conflict and violence every single day and as long as you have means to do that, I run, I read normal books as well. Um, I have family, I have cats, you know, as long as you have stuff like that and you understand where your limits are and how to look after yourself, then that's, that's important. Thank you for that, Jess. I think, I think it is fair to say it is, um, it is very rewarding. I think speaking to our, um, our alumni across, across the years and the roles that they're playing, um, in a variety of humanitarian sectors, so working for Oxfam or the UN in the field, it is, as Jess says, um, it, it really does get to you. It's something that, that to see some of the, the hardest situations that are occurring globally every day, um, it opens you up to um, a lot of pain at points. And so I know humanitarian actors, when they're in the field, while it is rewarding when you're making a difference and, and trying to support that change, it is frustrating because you can't make it all better. And you also see that all the problems and the challenges, and it can be frustrating. However, there are people that need to keep making those small steps and those small improvements so that they create larger improvements and create structural change and um, a more fair and just society throughout the world. And that's something I, I um, identify with Jess about in terms of as an educator and coming from an education background, I'm a teacher, a secondary school teacher, in my background. Um, the best way that I can contribute to this change is by supporting the next generation of learners in how they can find those skills and better equip themselves when they're going forward. So supporting Marcel, supporting ICRA, supporting all of our undergraduates, our postgraduates, doing youth outreach activities, going into schools and discussing what it means to engage with humanitarian topics. How can we do this in a way that's informed and um, in a way that's empathetic so that we're understanding what's happening in, in other societies, other experiences that, that people go through. And I think that's what's important. So I find that incredibly rewarding. And, and I know Jess will have had this as well, where you get an email back from one of your students or a past student saying, this has really resonated with me and it's really stayed with me, or I was able to put this in place in my job and it's really helped. Um, or we had our um, UG students come back for um, uh, the graduation and, and being able to kind of talk at graduation, what jobs they're going into and seeing the difference they're talking about. We're getting references for them applying for jobs at the UN. It, it makes a difference. And you feel like we've had that little spark to push them forward and, and they'll have that spark on someone else. So yeah, I think eventually it is rewarding, but it is also uh, very heavy stuff that we, we talk about. So we'll now hand over to Marcel so he can give us a bit more about his background and what he's doing um, and that student experience at the undergraduate level. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm Marcel. I'm a third year international disaster management and humanitarian response student. That doesn't get easier saying it, trust me. <laughs> Try saying that in a club as well. They'll be like, what? What's, what's that? What's that? They'll never know. Um, yeah, my experience is a bit different to yours. Um, I came in through college. I was studying public services um, and then kind of found this degree uh, at the last minute, really. Because um, my course advisor said that, um, like, what do you want to do afterwards? And I was like, probably a firefighter. So, oh, okay, so you're kind of like helping people. Um, I was, like, I was like, yeah, um, I want something kind of on the grand scheme of things. And then she told me about this new degree that I'd only been running for about three years, I think, at the time, was it, Jess? It was, it was quite, a, like, a, quite a new degree. Um, and then I kind of found out more about it. Um, went to one of the open days, but 
I missed the first one, so I had to go to the second one, and I was the only student there, so it was a bit daunting. But the staff were really nice. Um, I met Bertrand. He was the previous convener, wasn't he? Um, no, he's, he's always been our director. director yeah. Um, yeah, so he was one of the founding mem members of HCRI over 10 years ago. So Bertrand's always been here. Yeah, he's a staple piece of the HCRI now. Um, so I met him, um, kind of went through the degree, found, out, found it quite interesting. Um, and then I thought, yeah, I may as well go for it. Because I know there's another degree um, in Coventry, where I'm from, that's been doing disaster management for about 30 years. But I'm from Coventry. Um, so I kind of wanted to venture out of my own area into a new world. And Manchester is probably the best place I could have picked, to be quite honest. Um, the university um, itself, uh, in first year, it was daunting. Um, I won't lie. Uh, I've never really wrote, and I'm not the most academically um, proficient person, definitely. Uh, so first year was a big step up for me. Um, but like, there are resources available, um, and the lecturers within HCRI are probably some of the most attentive um, and like compassionate and understanding lecturers that are in the university. Um, I think we all kind of care about each other. Like, I know Jess is really passionate about her students. She like even how big she was bigging me up a minute ago, like she, she does care. Um, and like in first year, um, my voice wasn't really that loud as in like a student voice. Um, and then like through my degree, um, I kind of ventured into volunteering a bit more. Um, specifically, I started out on Christmas night, Christmas day night, um, volunteering at a homeless shelter. That was my first kind of instance with volunteering full stop. Um, and then that was first year and then second year, um, did it again. Um, and then towards like the end of third, the end of second year, start of third year. So that was this summer that I'd just gone. Um, but Black Lives Matter kind of came onto the scene. Um, and I'll show you a bit of kind of what I did with that. Um, so this is a picture from in Birmingham. Um, I think it was July 4th. Uh, this was one of the protests that I helped kind of lead uh, with my friends. Um, I think 2000 people came at this point. Um, and these are just some of the photos from it. There's some videos. Um, this was probably one of the craziest like kind of experiences I've had. Um, we started off in like Birmingham center and then worked our way around. Um, and then shut down a few roads, shut down Birmingham City Centre. Um, and then the next one, this was in Coventry, I think, um, where I'm from. Uh, yeah, this one. This is where we ended up shutting down a portion of the M6. Um, and then I think I can share this other screen. Um, are you seeing my screen? Yep. Oh, no. Uh, which the... So we can see your... Uh, slideshow pictures. Okay, let me. This one? Yeah. Here we go. So, uh, this is how my own kind of um, uh, news, agent, news uh, people labeled us as numbskulls. But it was quite nice to get that attention that we shut down the M6. Um, and then a few of our members went on ITV, spoke about that. Um, and then, kind of from this, um, it led to like more opportunities open up within university, I found. Um, so for example, when I first came back in third year, I got asked to kind of help develop an anti-racism workshop uh, to deliver to students and lecturers. I think it's about the same numbers as we've got here today. Um, and then we kind of looked at institutional racism within the British media. Uh, and then we looked at comparisons um, between like footballers. Um, so we got Phil Foden on the left and then uh, another footballer on the right, kind of the way in which like, black people are portrayed in media. Um, and then we had between Kate and Megan, which was quite interesting. You got on the right how Megan kind of contributed to human rights abuses by eating the avocado, but Kate thinks it's cute. Um, and then kind of like, we tr went through scapegoating and how like um, BAM communities, communities have been scapegoated through COVID. And then it also kind of linked to how students have been scapegoated through COVID um, as COVID parties and so much, as I'm sure you've heard. 
Um, and then I'll share my other screen again. Um, and then more recently, um, I'm sure a few of you may have seen the protests in kind of Manchester, uh, kind of with the fences. Uh, I've been kind of at the heart of all of this um, and how it's organized that fence protest where we kind of tore the fences down. Um, these are just some of the photos. It was probably one of the best examples of students coming together I've seen since being here. Um, I think the student spirit had been lacking up until this point. Um, like there's a big buildup of our energy. Um, and honestly, like some of the numbers that came to this were kind of incredible. Uh, and then it kind of led to more and more protests. Um, but throughout this whole thing um, of like volunteering and protesting, uh, I must say that HRI has encouraged it. Um, like having that staple piece and having the understanding of what I'm actually kind of protesting against or volunteering for, it's helped me understand the wider impacts of this rather than just like the, oh, they're protesting again or oh, they're tearing a fence down. It doesn't really mean anything. It's actually like the structural kind of issues that you're understanding more so. Um, and yeah, so to more opportunities, I think now since I've kind of done all the volunteering and everything, I've got a TED talk coming up soon, um, which HCRI helped me with. Um, so that should be fun. I'm helping to implement a school project where I'm going to be uh, like discussing HCRI and my degree to um, young black uh, kids in schools. Um, just loads and loads of different things. Um, but the person I was in first year is definitely not the person I am now. University is a it's a wave, like there's, it goes up and down. Um, it's not gonna be a great day every day. There will be days you wanna drop out. I wanted to drop out a few times, but you gotta kind of stick with it and look at it in the grand scheme of things of what you wanna achieve. Like if you're looking at this degree and thinking international disaster management and humanitarian response sounds interesting. Yeah, it, it is interesting. Like some of the modules that we've done, um, I'll share my screen again. If I can find it. Um, but these are some of the first year modules I did. Um, so I think these, all of these are compulsory. Um, and then as we go into second year, uh, you can kind of branch off into what you wrote, like you, you want. Um, so I did everyday peace building with Catherine. That was really interesting. Uh, disaster and development also really interesting. We kind of looked at, um, the geopolitics and how everything plays out and together. Uh, and then a few of the other ones. And then this one in particular, the professional experience project. That was probably one of my favorite ones um, just because I got to work with a organization called Team Rubicon um, and they're specifically uh, kind of interested in disaster response. So for that project, um, me and two other girls, we were tasked with designing a disaster risk reduction strategy project to be implemented in Malawi. Uh, so we kind of came up with the community center, um, did all the background work. It was kind of learning as we go. Um, but it was really like hands on and the organization we were working with were really like, quite nice actually in the end. Um, and then we actually got the opportunity to present it to them in person. So we got to go down to their headquarters down in Salisbury, um, play some drinking games with them, which I didn't expect, but that was a good laugh. Um, and then at the end of it, they offered me an internship. Um, so after I finished this degree, I got a six month, six month internship with them lined up. But there's also other organizations that we're doing it with as well. So there isn't just disaster response that you've got to look into. It's just whatever you kind of get interested in. Um, and yeah, if there's any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you so much, Marcel. That was absolutely, it was great to hear your story. And, you know, um, Jess and I are obviously incredibly proud of, of the journey you've kind of come on. Um, and it was, I didn't know you in your first year, so it was quite moving to hear how you identified not really having a voice in first year. And then by the time you've gotten to third, third year, um, ending it with a TED talk coming up on the card. So that's huge. And you should be incredibly proud of yourself for all of this. Um, I'm choking up slightly about your story. Okay, I'll hand over to Ikra now before I go embarrass myself. Uh, mm -hmm. So Ikra, please, uh, let's hear a bit more about your journey. Brilliant. Well, hi everyone. I'm Ikra. Um, so thanks, um, myself for going. I think it's really. I'm really glad to kind of like share, um, share my journey as well and to kind of like how I got into HRI. So um, I'll just share my screen. 
So yeah, so my name is Ikra. Um, I'm a master's student. I'm doing humanitarianism and conflict response. Um, I'll kind of go a bit about my journey into higher education in general and also how I kind of came into my master's. I'll also kind of go over things I'm currently doing, my future kind of goals, and any kind of like advice I'd give to my younger self. Um, I say advice to my younger self just because I think everybody's experiences are different, but I think taking things from other people's journeys and kind of understanding and reflecting on what, why they give the advice they give is really important and you can kind of apply it to your own experiences too. So um, these are a couple of things that I've been involved in. I'll kind of go over more of them in the next slide, but um, these all, all these things that I'm going to show pictures of here and proof of and evidence of, um, they aren't, they, they're all linked in really weird ways. And I can explain how I kind of came through this. It's really weird. And I think, like Jess was saying before, Marcel, like your journey just happened unexpectedly. Some things don't happen in the way you plan. And that's okay. It's okay to do that sometimes. So my journey into higher education in general so i start from sixth form because where i think a lot of you are at right now is a levels or an equivalent so written here did history psychology and politics i actually didn't so i initially started doing biology chemistry history and psychology and you were able to choose four a levels at the time i was in sixth form and you were able to drop a fourth one and go when you're going to your second year so my decision was going to sciences and going to the medicine field okay so there was this massive kind of change in second week. I was like, I don't think that's for me. I think actually looking more on it, yes, I like history, I like sciences, but I'm actually more passionate for the humanities. I think this is something that I need to get into. Um, I applied for something called the Manchester Access Programme as well, which is a access programme designed for young people from Greater Manchester with a disadvantaged background. So I am, when I remember my parents went to university, um, I'm from a low income background. Um, uh, but I was a, as a high achiever, I kind of went to this program and stuff, and it was quite an influential, impactful program. I'll talk more about that in a second. But um, there was also an experience during sixth form where I was in my second year, and I kind of, whilst on the Manchester program as well, and volunteering and doing all these things, started thinking about is university the right choice for me? Do I want to do it? And there was this kind of hesitation, um, and it was quite, quite a weird patch in my life where I thought, actually do I want to do this should I continue with the Manchester Access program should I continue with A levels should I just drop out and get a job like what's the best journey for me um, and my parents quite support they were like do what you want to do but like you have to do something you can't just think well I'm, I don't know like I'll just fluke it because this is a quite big impactful choice like you're gonna take a year out what are you gonna do um so I just continued volunteering so I at this point um I'd also like volunteering at Manchester Museum um and whilst I was volunteering there I think, like I was saying as well, the importance of kind of volunteering doing different things, it reinforced that, like, yes, I actually do want to do something within history. I want to go back into that kind of field. And so kind of went back in, so I did really, really hard my A-levels, um, finished my access programme, and that um, allowed me to kind of enter higher education in a way that I wouldn't have been able to otherwise. The Manchester Access Programme is a programme design, um, and it kind of does things where it gives you an insight into university life, okay? So I used to do an essay, for example, um, went to lectures and uh, seminars, they talked about student finance, things that I wasn't really aware of and kind of discussed and kind of spoke about the fears and anxieties I think I'd had about university life, how I'd be able to fund myself, what's that university life like, what about support is available, like what, what how do I make friends, I don't understand. Um, and so that was quite impactful. Um, but luckily I completed it and everything was fine, I got in, I accepted into university and history. Um, the interesting thing is the essay that I did at my mental access program was based on gender and changing perceptions of fashion. And that's also what I did for my um, dissertation in my third year. I did my dissertation on fashion femininity in 1960s Britain. Um, it was a 12,000 word um, long um, dissertation. Um, and it's nothing to do with HCRI, but I think there's, a, there's definitely a link in terms of what I'd experienced during this program and what I did during my time at university. So again, at my time at university, I focused on race and gender a lot. I think the history that I was interested in was to do with like colonialism um, and gender aspects of that as well. Um, and that kind of led up to my dissertation. But I also worked as an ambassador, a scholarship ambassador as well. That experiences and those experiences was volunteering at Manchester Museum, where I also kind of did things to support projects like the South Asian Gallery project that's currently being um, implemented in the Manchester Museum. And also kind of just doing general stuff. I did a um, talk for and designed an event for inclusivity for women of colour in the cultural sector. And those things kind of reinforce this idea of like going into this kind of um, area. Um, after graduating, um, I think there was a struggle in terms of what do I want to do and what do I want to go into. Um, I accessed a career service at the University of Manchester. Um, Kind of, they kind of gave insight into different things, different roles, and kind of went over those things with me. And one thing that Manchester offers is this Manchester Graduate Talent Programme. 
So it's for interns, um, you can apply for internships within the University of Manchester on the year you're graduating. So I applied to loads of them and I was accepted onto one as the um, WP being a graduate intern. This was an internship, I think, definitely reinforced a lot of things I wanted to do and kind of pushed me towards doing this master's in general. So we did things, for example, I was on projects where I did Black Lawyers Master Project, which targets young people, um, particularly young black males, um, and kind of, because um, there's an underrepresentation of black males in the law um, sector at University of Manchester, and kind of, um, that's something what we do. And then also do Diverse Champions Project, which is an anti-hate crime, hate crime awareness project. Um, so we, you know, work with youngest people from there in different schools across Greater Manchester. And the final one that was kind of like a big massive push in terms of doing this master's in general was the University of Sanctuary Initiative. So the University of Manchester is a university, a university of sanctuary, and so is the Manchester Museum. Um, so that's Moon Centre. So um, they received this award um, last year, I think, yeah, last year, or the year before, it was the year before. Um, and it's to do something where you have to make the university and institutions a safe place, safe place for sanctuary seekers. The work we have to do for this included things like Article 26 scholarship, which is scholarship designed for students from sanctuary seeker backgrounds to help them access the university because there's a lot of barriers they'll face, for example, student fees, tuition fees, um, and then also having to earn it, because there's barriers in terms of earning income to support themselves at university. And whilst doing these different projects, I think it definitely highlights to me like the importance of Actually, yeah, there's a place of privilege I'm at. Like I've always been able to access student finance. There was never those barriers in terms of in that. So I think it kind of opened up discussions. I started, we worked with the City of Sanctuary and that's where I also volunteer now as well. Um, and it kind of like reinforced the idea of, I think I need to do more. I need to do more basically. Um, so at the end of my internship, actually, they asked me um, to talk about my experiences for the WP report. Um, so this was my, what I said um, about my time. Um, but the main thing was that doing these different experiences all together, kind of linked together and, and reinforced this passion that, um, yeah, I want to work in the humanitarian sector. And actually there are, there are, this is the area that I want to go and continue with in terms of my career, in terms of my passion, in terms of like why it is I think needs to change. Um, so I'm currently doing my master's in humanitarianism and conflict response. We do a variety of different modules. The ones I've done so far include anthropology of violence and emergency humanitarian assistance and conflict analysis as well. All of them are completely different um, and then the same at the same time. So we have to do things like a training handbook as one of the examples I've done for, I uh, have to do for emergency humanitarian assistance. We've done book reviews for anthropology and essay writing for conflict analysis. Um, and then they're quite interesting because that kind of led to this idea of like looking at structural violence in itself and this idea of institutional kind of violence which has led to me kind of looking at that concept in itself for my dissertation so those of you that are here at the beginning I was talking to Amanda about my dissertation I want to focus on education there's barriers to education and I'm aware on the first hand and I'm aware that other people also face these barriers it's important that we acknowledge this and kind of like work towards how can we um, overcome those barriers and stuff like that. So that's my main area of interest and that's kind of what I want to go into. Um, so that's something that I'm kind of walking to in terms of academic, but I'm also doing things alongside that. So a part of the HCRI Society, I work as a diversity and inclusion ambassador. So I work um, with the Students' Union in terms of like looking at different projects to help make the university an uh, inclusive place. So for example, right now I'm doing something on the access and participation plan. Um, and I work with um, different people in the university for that. I'm also a student partner intern in the career service as well. And I'm a sub editor in Incolor magazine, which is a university um, student led magazine from the University of Manchester for people of color, by people of color. Um, and so they're the kind of things that I'm doing. And like what Jessica was saying before as well, it's really important that yes, education is really important. That's when you come to university. Um, but you need to do other things alongside that as well. University get, offers you so many different options and opportunities. And that's really important. Yes, you can make for education, yes, you can do modules, but like Marcel's been doing, I just was saying, it's really important to kind of get into everything. I didn't take advantage from undergrad as much as I should have. I think right now for maths, I'm trying to make up for it a little bit, but those are things I want to do. So I think these things and all these experiences have definitely shaped my um, beliefs in terms of I actually want to go into the future, I want to do go into the education centre, I want to work within communities, youth centres, the cultural sector even. One thing that I applied for before the pandemic was um, this internship at Brooklyn Museum. Um, it was to do with education and um, like there was a the project that where you can, for example, young people who um, from low income backgrounds could um, 
volunteer hours to working workshops with young people, gain a volunteering experience, and then trade those hours um, for an art workshop class that, that um, where there may be various access. And I think just looking at those things and understanding that these are things that we can kind of implement and kind of working on that, I think that's kind of the area I want to go into. Um, but just to finish off, advice me and yourself. I think, yes, volunteer and join societies. It's important that you kind of look at things in a holistic perspective, but also be kind to yourself. Um, like myself saying, there'll be times where it'll be challenging and that's okay. Like take time for yourself, be gentle, um, do things and implement self-care. This, it can be quite heavy, these topics that we discuss. Um, I think so like what I do is sometimes I'll do yoga, I go on long walks, I exercise quite a bit. And um, then I also do things that just relax, I just watch Netflix and stuff. But it's important that we do implement different forms of like um, self-care and kind of being nice to yourself and kind to yourself. Life happens and it's okay. Um, but that is all I have. I say all I have, I'm just speaking for that long, but <laughs> yeah. you speak so quickly, you can get a lot in it. <laughs> <laughs> you did a fantastic job thank you so much for talking about your journey as well um i'm just gonna we i realize that we are coming up to the end of our hours but so i know some of our our attendees will have to be running off in case they've got um classes starting at two o'clock so please don't feel bad if you do need to to run off um and attend a class we understand this is all being recorded and Jessica will be, uh, Murphy will be sending that out afterwards as a recording for you all to kind of watch back or catch up on. Um, and what I just wanted to pose one question that came up that I know um, Marcel's already answered, but what's your favorite thing about the University of Manchester? Um, so Marcel, I'll have you just briefly do that and then Ikra, if you can tell us what your favorite thing is. Um, yeah, like I said in the reply, it's probably the city itself. Um, but when it's not locked down um, and in the middle of the pandemic, uh, like the city is really nice. Like there's so many different things we can do here. Um, I'm from Coventry, so coming from a place where there's only two clubs to come into a place where there's a club on every street, it's a nice, nice um, mix up. I'd also probably say the people. Um, like some of the people you'll meet um, are probably going to be people, people you know for a while. It's not so much about knowing so many people. Um, I think that kind of gets confused in the university image. Like you don't have to know everyone. It's more about finding them people that you want to know and kind of get to develop them relationships with. Because there are people here that you will know for life, but it's not everyone. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point to make as well, Marcel. Like the University of Manchester is huge. Like we are we're we're a huge campus. We're a big university, but we're a very small department. So you really get to know the other people on your course. You, as you may have noticed, Jess and I are very aware of who our students are and, and what they're up to and what they're doing. But uh, we kind of take pride in, in getting to know the experiences and the backgrounds of our students. Um, so yes, there are a lot of people here, but it's about building those relationships and those connections. Um, and well, throughout my time with HR, I realize you kind of are better able to write identify people that you get on with and that you can have those those deep meaningful conversations or work towards making change um, and, and develop your passions with. Um, so it's a really good point that Marcel's made there. Ikra, what's your favorite thing? Yeah, I think I'm from Manchester. So um, definitely opportunities, I think. Um, I'm aware of the different opportunities that Manchester can offer. I guess, <laughs> um, such as like I, I told you about the jobs I'm, I'm currently in. There's lots of opportunities for students to get involved. Student union is pretty big. Um, societies that are there, I think, but just those opportunities kind of get involved in different sectors. They have things like Sellify Awards as well, like the volunteers. So the university does offer and caters to different things, and I think that's something that I think is really nice to kind of see. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a great point, and I love we we had one one comment that was posted for the question and answer that just said that I love charity work. So I think, you know, if you did come to University of Manchester, um, look and Stellify, because that'll really enhance and um, support that love that you have for charity work. But I think most people that join our department do it with the best of intentions to try to make a difference in some way, in some capacity. Um, and while you're, you're seeing two of our students who are incredibly confident at the moment in expressing their views, their passions, what they want to do. Our students don't start that way. Um, I think it's fair to say first year, 
of undergrad or even the beginning of your master's, you have a better idea of what you want to do, but you're still, you're coming into it thinking, I'm not really sure where the, the journey's going to go. And that's okay. And we're kind of here to support you throughout that. You have your academic advisors, you'll have your, your lecturers, your peers to all kind of talk through those different aspects. Um, and it's about that journey. It's about that evolution of, of you becoming, um, growing into the role you want to be and, and how you want to contribute to that to wider society. Um, and for us, we hope to support you in that journey. Um, but I think it's always a big thing when we're talking about careers day that, I mean, from my perspective, I had no idea I would end up in the career and in, in the place where I am now. If I asked my 18 year old self, it would be, you know, joining the Peace Corps and, and working abroad for years and years and, and going that route, but life changes and things happen. Um, and it's about evolving and adjusting to that as you go. So, um, I think we'll we'll end it there because I realize we are we've at, we're at time and everybody's got meetings and classes and everything to do. But thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed the session. If you have any questions, please do feel free to email and get in touch with me. Um, you can also email hcri at manchester.ac.uk. And our lovely staff, so Jess Murphy and Claire, they're both some of our lovely uh, support staff. They'll be able to direct you either to myself, to myself, Ikra, Jess, uh, Lisa, or uh, Rubina, who does our integrating medics program. Um, we're all happy to help answer questions. And if you're thinking of applying, you can also email me or email the admissions department and they'll put you in touch with me as well. Oh, thank you, Jess, she's just posted um, our email address there. But yeah, if, if there's anything we can do to help, or if you'd like to learn more, I know there's some really big questions that we, we were, had submitted beforehand we didn't get a chance to talk about, feel free to come along and attend our event. So we, we hold regular events where we kind of talk about these big issues, like are we doing enough in terms of COVID response or anything like that. You're welcome to attend these. They're all free events that we put on there, also on Zoom, in case you're not Zoomed out. Um, or if you'd like to have one of our ambassadors like Marcel or Iker kind of come into your school and, and talk about humanitarian responses and really get into those discussions and engage with it, we can do that too. But thank you again for joining us. It has been an absolute pleasure. I hope you all have a lovely day.